there's a scientific consensus that humans have caused global warming uh, over the last century. Uh, what's the current state of scientific opinion about the human role over the last 7,000 years? Um, I'd say it's in flux. Uh, if you go back to the 1900s, right up to the turn of the century, everyone believed that uh, climate during the Holocene was warm because of uh, natural factors. The orbital forcing had pushed us out of the last glaciation into this inner glaciation and the orbital forces forcing hadn't yet got to the point of pushing us back into the first step of a glaciation. So in 2003 I suggested that that uh, humans had played a role in that and had kept the climate warmer uh, starting around 7,000 years ago and building building through the millennia even before the industrial revolution. So that's 10 years ago that I made that suggestion and there's been a real vigorous debate on that. I'd say there's at least 50 papers published and the literature is scattered all over the place in different journals. And so there's very few people that are up to date on the current state of the argument. I'm up to date and in my opinion, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, we're just about to go from majority paradigm that this interglaciation was natural until the Industrial Revolution to the view that uh, humans started taking control increasingly and that we wouldn't be in a full interglaciation if it hadn't been for humans, early farmers. So if humans hadn't been around, what would climate have done over the last few thousand years and currently? It's, um, it depends on latitude. If you're in the tropics, it would be a little bit cooler. But if you're up in uh, uh, the northern tier, let's say Siberia, uh, Alaska, Brooks Range, northern Rockies, Canadian archipelago, uh, Norwegian Alps, uh, you'd be under permanent snow cover, which would have turned into the beginnings of ice sheets, small ice sheets. So up there it would be radically different and one effect that would have projected farther south is that uh, it, would, it would be cooler in the summer at northern mid-latitudes, cool enough that you couldn't uh, grow crops as far north as you do now. Could you explain for people who wouldn't be familiar with the concept, what drives Milankovitch cycles and what role CO2 plays in them? Well, basically, uh, there are two factors, two and a half factors in the orbital cycles. One is very simple, it's the tilt of the orbit, whether the Earth and particularly the high northern latitudes where ice sheets grow, whether they lean towards the sun in summer, which keeps ice sheets from growing or melts them, whether it leans well towards the sun, which keeps ice sheets from growing, uh, or whether the tilt is smaller and not so much towards the sun, which reduces the sunlight into high latitudes and allows ice sheets to grow. So it's the amount of tilt. The ice ages are caused by features of Earth's orbit. Your brightness is the sun, this is the Earth, I, this is the equator, here is the North Pole. Yes. If the North Pole stood straight up, you I, could never give me a sunburn on my bald spot. But in I, fact, as you know, it is tipped over a little bit and it nods a little more and a little less over 41,000 years. Now, when it nods more, right. my bald spot ice melts and the right. um, equator is a little more shaded and now the ice grows and now the ice melts, but it takes 41,000 years for this change to happen. The other factor is that the Earth, when it, as it uh, orbits around the sun, it wobbles, it processes, and, and the, the orbit is not perfectly circular, it's eccentric to a small extent, and so you can have a summer occur with the Earth in the northern hemisphere tilting towards the sun, but you're far away from the sun, or you can have one at a time when you're in a part of the orbit where you're tilting towards the sun and getting a lot of sunlight. So that also affects climate. So those together, those make uh, cycles of 100,000, 41,000, 23,000 years. So um, the Ice Age cycles are driven by changes in the Earth's orbit and tilt. So what role does CO2 play? There's still some 
uh, discussion about the natural role of CO2. By the timing of the CO2 changes, which you can see from measurements of air bubbles and ice cores, basically CO2 is uh, high when climate is warm during the times when ice sheets are small, we're in interglacials, and CO2 is lower when we're in times of uh, glacial climate when the ice sheets are on North America and Scandinavia. So ice sheets and CO2 go together big, and they're, they're coupled in some way. There's a bit of a chicken and egg argument to, to the CO2 changes lead and push the ice sheets. Do the ice sheets go first and bring the CO2 along with them? My opinion is, is that the ice sheets uh, go first and that the CO2 is an amplifier. The fact that the ice sheets go first and then the CO2 follows is, has led to a myth that that proves that um, the temperature drives CO2, which therefore means that CO2 doesn't drive temperature, and as, as a way of arguing that CO2 doesn't have much of an effect on temperature. There is a myth that, that temperature, global temperature, leads CO2, but that's, in recent work shows that's that's not so. They seem to be very closely coupled. Temperature is most easily measured in the uh, Antarctic region, and our, the Antarctic region is an early responder to changes in, in the orbit. The real question is whether CO2 leads, well, you can ask whether CO2 leads global temperature, and the ice sheets are playing a role in global temperature, a very strong role, and so if the ice sheets the ice sheets determine temperature for a large part of the northern hemisphere uh, and that probably lags CO2 uh, very slightly. So, so you have two things going on. Insulation's making the ice sheets grow and shrink. The ice sheets are affecting CO2, but CO2 can react faster than the push it gets from the ice sheets.